Can you listen? I mean, I want to give you a quick overview of the agenda and then we get started. So, we we'll start with the introduction of the ACIU, the, the organization that's hosting this event. Uh, then, followed by sign up, talking for about an hour about the last three years of the digital company. And then we'll have a QA towards the end. And uh, during the QA, we'll also set up dinner. So, please take care of the people, socialize, uh, and ask questions. And uh, yeah, we'll have books. So, Google purchase books, and there's some more books uh, there if you want to read more. Uh, and sign up and also sign them for you. Okay. Uh, let's start with Samitra, who's uh, going to introduce the ACI. AID is a non-profit organization uh, which was established in 1991 by Dr. Ravi Kuchmanji at uh, University of Maryland. Dr. Ravi has a postdoc from uh, University of Virginia and he still continues to publish uh, papers in physics while uh, being very actively involved in AID. He and his wife Aravinda are very deeply involved in all of uh, the activities that uh, AID does. Uh, they participated in the Narmada Bashao on Google and also have worked on several grassroots projects in India. A fun fact for all of you uh, the movie Swadesh, Shah Rukh Khan's movie Swadesh, was actually inspired by a real life uh, project today. Ashutosh Bhavarika, who is the director, uh, was very inspired by a news article that was published in Times of India in 2000, which talked about this project. Uh, highlighting the fact that a you know, very remote tribal village in the Narmada Valley was able to produce electricity in the volunteers. So, this uh, example uh, of Bill Brown and how uh, positively the work of these volunteers impacted the community there really appeals and inspires a lot of us. So, there are several such projects uh, that AID has taken up over the last 32 years that have a similar positive stories in enabling and empowering marginalized communities in India. We have about uh, 38 chapters in the US, 38 chapters in the US, and ACM chapter is one of them. AID uh, believes in the philosophy that. Um, <coughs> It uh, believes in the philosophy that uh, problems are interconnected and so should the solutions be. So, we partner with a lot of uh, grassroots organizations in India um, to uh, support initiatives in a variety of areas. And uh, since 2014, we've disbursed more than a million dollars uh, towards projects, uh, around, uh, about 100 projects, in all of these categories across uh, various states in India. So why we are we here today? Uh, please do take the opportunity to learn more about AID. We have an AID table set up outside and a uh, few of volunteers are around. So please do talk to us on how you can get engaged. You can donate to any of the causes that AID supports and also give your time by reviewing uh, some of these projects, doing site visits when you are going back home and uh, also helping us organize events. We do fundraising events, awareness events and uh, uh, host talks like these um, by uh, you know our partners and activists uh, whose philosophies uh, you know relates to me. And of course, there's a lot of back end work also that uh, we can totally leverage uh, uh, your help for. So uh, yeah, thank you for being here. I'll uh, hand it over to Abhinay now so we can introduce Sam. So, just a quick couple of questions. Two questions. Uh, who's, there, who's here has heard about AID before? So, since we're here, okay, that's a good one. Uh, how about Sainath? Who's heard about his mom? So, it's like the next five minutes of my time will be over. Introduce him. So, he's a journalist of Party to the Platform about it. He's a journalist who's been covering rural India for about 30 years uh, in his overall reporting career of 33 years. Since 1980, he's covered every government in India, uh, being critical, high and independent of every one of them. Uh, both, uh, both at the same time being critical and also working with the government when necessary. Uh, he's worked in the agri mission of the Delhi government. He's, worked, he's part of the Freedom of Expression Committee during the Indian government. He's part of the EPL census. It's a bill of the body line uh, uh, survey that was done. This was done during UP. Uh, so 
this collaboration with the government basically highlights the difference between working with the government and working for the government. That's why I call him a different breed of journalist. Uh, he, until 2014, he was a rural affairs editor of Hindu. Uh, during his time, he led the efforts to bring rural India to the forefront of Indian newspaper and Indian media. This was one of the rare efforts that was uh, that was led by him throughout his career uh, since 1989. Uh, so he's worked at farm suicides, uh, and uh, the agrarian crisis was covered in a documentary called News Guests. Uh, Texas University School of Journalism actually has a class with a chapter titled The Journalism of Peace Island. And that's not the only university that's just an example that he knew. A lot of universities which use his book as, a, as content and uh, talk about his work. Uh, so he left Hindu and started Pali uh, in effort to archive rural India. It was Actually, for the difficult for you to understand, he introduced that thing, but he'll talk more about it. But the idea is to document all the culture, the languages, basically every everyday lives of everybody, sorry, of everybody, of common people. Uh, in just seven years of its inception, Pari has won over 60 journalism awards. Uh, and then his book, Everybody Loves a Good Rod, which was covering the Academy of Crisis and Long Suicides, is in 60th evening. I think the publishers are a little. Happy about it. Uh, we have those copies as well for sale, along with the current book that we're talking about, that he's going to talk about. Uh, he's received every single media journalism award. I think there are no more awards in there. Uh, so I don't know. I thought I'd make his life, but I thought it's too late. Yeah. So I'm going to highlight a few of them. Uh, Raman Maxis Award, uh, in case you don't know it's called the Asia's Global Prize. Uh, the Fukuoka Grand Prize, it's one of the top Japan's, sorry, Japan's top international awards. Uh, first reporter, he was the first reporter in the world to get Amnesty International's Human Rights Journalism Award. Uh, he was awarded with the Ramana Goyka Journalist from the year 2009. Um, he was given the United Nations FAO Award Award, considered the foremost prize in development of journalism. Uh, the only Indian, he was the only Indian journalist to win the European Commission's First, uh, sorry, uh, Natani first prize for this coverage of human, human rights and development. And uh, so one of the things that we use, usually use to introduce people is to share the, share the awards that they've got. I also wanted to add some, there were the awards that he rejected, uh, which is not that <laughs> common. So, YSR prize, uh, this was in last year or a couple of years ago, uh, it was about 1 million rupees. I will not be happy about it. Uh, and uh, he turned on the Padma Bhushan in 2009. Uh, he actually has a very interesting reason for this. He believes that, listen to me carefully, he believes that journalists are external auditors to the government and they should never accept any awards or favors from the government with their government. So that is again why I call him a media of journalists. Um, so he's one of the whose employer called him the bad boy of Indian journalism. And uh, who we can check out the call the conscience of Indian nation. He signed us. Thanks very much. Actually, the first talk I did for AIM was in 1994. And I don't know which number this is in the list, but it's the third AIM talk on this too. Since, uh, since, since the 18th of this month. Of, of November in the Bay Area, Los Angeles. And then one AIB talk in Portland, then was the third. But from 1994, I have no idea which number it is. Many of the old agents who have gone back to India are still in touch with me. Uh, anyway, I'm here to plug my book. And last year, last August 15th, India completed, India completed seven, you can all hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. India completed 75 years of independence. 76th anniversary of independence, but 75 complete years of it. And this, it was simply astonishing, not only the very big events like 150th anniversary of Tagore or 125th anniversary of Gandhi. These kind of mega events are celebrated for three years. And so do this one. So do this one. But the 
the manner in which it was celebrated and what was celebrated is simply stunning and speaks to the complete evasion of the greatest chapter in Indian history where ordinary people whose battles spanned 190 years brought to its knees the mightiest empire the world has been. That's what they did. Yeah. So you think there would be something to commemorate the memory of the people who did that? Yes, sure. A very big uh, website was launched, official website. In fact, I was informed of it in its early phases. So we are doing this, it's a big thing, you'll be very proud of it, etc. Okay. So the web website is part of the thing called Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav, the nectar of Azadi. And it commemorates 75 years of independence. It's a site purportedly set up for your freedom fighters to honor them. It, and the money, um, the Azadi Kamrut Mahatsa first tranche, I didn't follow on what the second tranche was because I was so stunned by the numbers of the first. 110 crores, 1110 million rupees on the website that was attended events. You know, I found and run a website called People's Archive of Rural India. If we had 1% of that money, we'd double our sales. And ours is a permanent website. It's not for three years and then will not be relegated to the attic after those three years. So, the stunning thing about this website for our freedom fighters is that it successfully manages not to have a single program, not a single video, not a single story quote about, by, or of, of a living freedom. Not one. Second astonishing achievement, there is not a paragraph, a sentence about what British colonialism was, what it did to India. Two generations have now grown up who have no knowledge of what the impact of British rule was on India. So, I mean, it's, it's really the erasure of the most powerful chapter of your history. An alternative history is coming up in it. We'll, that's another conversation. We'll get into it later on. But imagine, you, know, you might want to ask, is it true that, that maybe there are no living freedom fighters? There is a pension list with 23,000 names and those pensions are being paid out. Many of those are dead and you're paying for families. But there are 60 people in this book who were very, very alive when I spoke to them. And in the, from the pensions list, we traced more than 100, 200 who are alive. Some of them are not articulate anymore, but they're around. How come you put up a website on 75 years of independence without a living freedom fighter. Uh, I'm not saying that there are no photos. There are hundreds of photographs, and you all know whose photographs. <coughs> right? Same photograph that's there on every COVID vaccine certificate. <laughs> Same photograph that is there on gas cylinders in some states. Same photograph that in April 2024, if things go badly for us, will be on every bus ticket. This is the Azadi Kabrut Mahatsa, the home page. Uh, well, you know, actually the first photograph is of Mr. Shah. Then Mr. Modi makes his appearance. Then he makes another modest appearance. And then another and another and another. And just in case you missed him the first four times, is there in a video. And in case you are not seated, then you have it there, further below, again, in the middle of the page, and again, and again, and a very interesting development happens here fully. See, the Azadi Kamrut Mahotsav, you can see the emblem and the logo, 
It's for 75 years of Indian independence. Next to it, what appears is the emblem and logo of G20. What that has to do with 75 years of independence can be the subject of a commission of inquiry for 10 years. <coughs> The, the G20 emblem, please also notice, is encased in the electoral symbol of the ruling party, the lotus or kamal. What it has absolutely nothing to do with independence, 75 years, nothing to do with anything. So what happens to your freedom fighters? Anyway, uh, what I did the, in the book, when the book came out. The book challenges the great man theory of history and it, you know, the great man theory of history which is widely subscribed to in most countries, most historiography. Things were terrible, awful until the Messiah came along. We seem to be rerunning the great man theory currently in our, in our own time. But, and then liberated the masses and you had independence and you had freedom, all that kind of stuff. I will say this to the credit of the great men, and sorry girls, it is only men that the great theory uh, admits of, doesn't, and no admission to women, though the book is full of women freedom fighters. Yeah? It's, that's part of the reply to the great man theory. And uh, the um, the book you know, you, you see, even with the great men, the interesting thing, and I must say this, in defense, in fairness to the great men of Indian freedom struggle history, all of them rejected the great man theory. All of them did. Hmm? Gandhi, in 1914, when being congratulated in London at a huge meeting, where he had returned triumphant from South Africa, Gandhi listens to all the speeches of praise and really, and that his reply makes me wonder how so many people can listen to nonsensical, non-stop praise and eulogies and take it as their due. He gets up and he says, the first line he says, your felicitations are to the wrong address. I was just a rakeel. The success of the workers in South Africa is entirely the victory of the indentured workers of South Africa, men, women, and children. He rejects credit for what happened. Next year, he goes to Champagne and realizes that the only force that can liberate India from the British rule is not a bunch of people sitting in the Bombay gym car, but the farmers, the workers, in the and that is the transition from Mohandas Karamchand to And he, his achievement singularly was to bring the masses into the movement. And that changed the course of what the British were fighting. However, it actually came more than a hundred years after others had begun the fight. And he recognizes this. Uh, in 1931, Prema Bai Kanta writes him a postcard the eulogical one, you have brought revolution, you have. Typical Gandhi switches over the page, writes a line. Great men appear to be the cause of revolutions. In truth, the people themselves are the cause. One line. Great men appear to be the cause of revolutions. In truth, the people themselves are the cause. The great Indian revolutionary, the greatest of Indian revolutionaries, Bhagat Singh, said something almost identical in a different language. In, when Bhagat Singh in prison is exchanging notes with his old faithful friend Pandit Shivnath Varma, they both are discussing the role and the place of revolutionaries of the armed revolution underground in the freedom struggle. And they, they come to this conclusion, we revolutionaries are the gems embedded on the beautiful, on to beautify the edifice of the building we call freedom. In truth, we, do we deserve this? 
We did not build the edifice. We did not lay the foundation. That was done by the suffering masses. That we are the gems mounted on the edifice. So a great man from the Ahimsa follower Gandhi to the armed revolutionary Bhagat Singh. All rejected the great man theory, but we all came on to it. And it's now being reintroduced in our textbooks in a great way. In the late 60s and early 70s, Indian historians brought out some spectacular things about the freedom struggle. Those, that was some of the best history writing ever done in India. All those books have been removed from the syllabus. They're being fucked. NCRT has thrown them out. Along with which NCRT, I should also say that you know, I have a vested interest in it. NCRT has thrown out a lot of my books also <laughs> on Vidarbha, farmer suicide, on, on all these sort of things, it's thrown it out. But I'm in distinguished company because in the same lot of expulsion, they threw out Charles Darwin. <laughs> Since obviously the th Darwin's theories are nonsense, right? They're all nonsense. The junior information, the junior education minister, Satyapal Singh, who set that process in motion, well known to me, was my old police commissioner in Mumbai, the city where I live, who I'm largely known as. Satyapal Singh, I remember I, he and I spoke successive days in his constituency, on, I think on the same stage, but successive different meetings, where he challenged this rubbish we follow code. You know, it happens elsewhere in the world in the name of intelligent design or all that kind of stuff. But so Satyakar Singh came up with irrefutable logic. Can you show me any any man who has gone into the jungle and watched apes turn into men? So that was the education minister and his level of intelligence. So it so happened that the next meeting was mine the next day and everybody had this to tell me he said this. I said, you know, it's, it's a fact, it's a refute. I do not know of anyone who has gone into the jungle and watched it turn into men, but you and I live in, we are, live in a privileged system. We, are, we, we have not seen it turn into men, but we have explicitly witnessed to the reverse process in those things. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's okay. Anyway, and by the way, I have developed a strong grudge against Charles Darwin. <laughs> okay. The, the kind of things that we keep, that has been done to history, the kind of things that are being done to your textbooks, you're they you're asking your children to go to schools where they will be taught nonsense. But never mind, my grudge against Darwin is the kind of people who are doing all this, please don't tell me that they and I have a common ancestor. I don't accept. <laughs> okay, not possible. Simply not possible and you're risking violence by such a thing. Okay, so the, this is the thing. When the book came out, I went to, in, in India, more than 40 universities and colleges and stuff where I presented the books to kids and asked them, you know, started the conversation in this way. So what are we celebrating? Every hand goes up. We are celebrating 75 years of independence. Yeah, sure. So what are we celebrating? Oh, in 19, more equal number of hands. So we threw out the British rule in 1947 and became an independent nation. Absolutely true. Okay. So my next question. I'm a journalist. I'm very I'm one of those pesky journalists who keeps asking questions <laughs> until someone turns wild. Okay. But uh, yeah. So why did you throw out the British? I mean, what do we have against the British, apart from the fact that they're a repulsive bunch of expletives deleted? But what do we have against them? Why did you throw them out? Then fewer hands go. Please take it from me. I am not blaming the kids. They have been robbed of their history. 
that generation. And my generation did the work. I accept collective responsibility for that state of affairs. But then a few hesitant hands go up. These are the kids who've learned the new economics. You know? Sir, the British imposed unfair terms of trade. I thought that's the accusation of every nation against every other nation in the time we live. You know? But we didn't take up our, we're not all taking your arms against each other. So, what did British do? What did the British do? Then some of the kids who were living, sitting a little quietly, maybe because of, you know, how it is, the lack of confidence of lesser privileged kids who then hesitantly say, Sir, I don't know, I didn't read it in my book, in my textbook, but my nanny told me that the British committed many atrocities against us and against our people. Then other voices chime. Then three, four kids repeat what the first kid said. Please note that their knowledge, that the genuine knowledge of the freedom struggle is coming not from their textbooks, but from their families. Okay? It's coming from their families. Not, and I every meeting of young people I say and I say to those who are here. Some of the kids in, I've been speaking to are young enough to have, um, you know, great grandparents alive. I tell them, go home today, speak to your grandparents and great grandparents, and ask them to tell you about the freedom struggle. I'm pleased to tell you that I have received more than a hundred emails. People saying I went and spoke to my granddad, and he told me stories that have have shocked the hell out of me. I don't know how to cope with this. Okay? That is you are looking at the erasure of your history. Now history is always written by the victor. And that's I mean that is a given. So who writes it at different times? We followed British historiography till the late 1960s, when a bunch of historians like Gobilan Thapar uh, Harbans Mukia, Vipin Chandra, S. Patacharya, S. Gopal, Sarvapuri Gopal, and while, until they started rebutting the nonsensical imperial historiography, they followed this. I went to school, presentation convent of the Sacred Heart, and I still have in my textbook the line, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Okay? And I come from a freedom struggle family. My granddad, who got kicked out of Ireland at the time of the Easter uprising, an Indian law student who got carried away by the Irish revolutionary fervor, joined the Sinn Fein, was part, he was very lucky to be deported and not executed. I always felt that the Irish take on the sun never sets on the British Empire was a far better one. I prefer it, it's accurate. The Irish revolutionary said, the sun never sets on the British Empire because even God can't trust those bastards in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Irish revolutionary take on it. Anyway, then when the dis discussion, had, when the kids have spoken for 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I start telling them that A, I was trained as a historian, not as a scientist. And what happened under British rule? What happened to you? At the end of it, you will find I could see several kids, tears running down their cheeks. For it, you know, they've heard of the Great Bengal famine of 1942-44. They don't know that that was the 31st famine policy induced famine for the British. A country which in the 600 years prior to British rule, had four major events. In 190 years, 31 famines, 40, 24 of which British demographers called major. Million people away. Okay. And the first of them was also called the Great Bengal Famine. It was 1770. Number of deaths, 10 million. Now, the British sense of fair play and you know, sport, sporting nature, let me tell you what. Warren Hastings 
said to the board of directors, and if you want to understand what corporations mean, you have to really look at the history of these two here. Then you know what corporations are. And uh, 10 million people have died, and Warren Hastings writes home boasting. He writes home boasting about it. I'm reading to you verbatim. Letter to the Court of Direct Report to the Court of Directors, November 3, 1772. The last pre famine year was 1768. 1769 it begins, 70 it rages, and it's called the famine of Great Bengal Famine of 1778. This is what it's called. This is what he is writing. Notwithstanding the loss of at least one third of the inhabitants of the province. 33% of all human beings in Bengal have died of famine. Agriculture has collapsed. And please remember that Bengal in those days meant Bengal, Bangladesh, Bihar, Odisha. All this was the Bengal presidency. Just like Madras presidency included what is today Andhra Pradesh and parts of Odisha. Dr. Baran. Notwithstanding the loss of at least one third of the inhabitants of the province and the consequent decline or of the of cultivation, it would be it would be natural to expect the net collections of the year 1772 would decline. Actually, the net collections of the year 1772 exceeded even those of 1768. It was naturally to be expected that the diminution of the revenue should have kept at an equal pace with the other consequences of so great a calamity that it did not, and he says this so proudly, that it did not, was owing to its being violently kept up to its former standards. He said a third of the residents died, a third of all people in Bengal died, but we beat the holy crap out of the rest and raised your revenues. And he's boasting about that to the and we make up arguments about the sporting nature of the nation and their sense of fair play. You know, some of the kids told me what they had to invite from their teachers or something. So the better no British colonial colonized us than the French or could it be the Dutch. Right? So look, choosing between colonialism and fundamentalism. <laughs> choosing between colonialism. Is the chicken choosing which sauce it wants to be cooked? <laughs> Honey glaze of Sichuan. Yeah. So I mean, th this is to be understood. Then comes the next pan, 1736. Dori Baja, that is the skull famine, called the skull famine by British historians because they left billions of skulls all over the country in the famine. Dori Baja. Then comes the Chalisa Pope. 11 million. The 1776 family, Chalisa, and 10 million dead. <clears throat> Comes to 1876, of the most peculiarly hideous family, though 8 million people died, not 10 million, known as the Madras family. The famine between Madras and Mysore, where you have, by that time, there is a press, there is newspaper report showing you that people trying to break into the cities are being clubbed to death at the barricades by the police. And by the way, it explains, I know that there are Telugus and Karadigas in this audience, it explains that 1876 famine scattered many of us all over in, in despair migrations. Yeah? And that's how so many Telugus came to be living in Chennai and Tamil Nadu. That's how so many Kannadigas from North Karnataka moved into South Karnataka. That's the famine disrupted everything. Anyway, the newspapers of the time, much better than the newspapers of our time, described faithfully what happened at the barricades. But they also describe another thing that is happening at the same time. 1876, the Grand Darbar of Queen Victoria, who one day found herself in possession of a very large piece of real estate. Today we call it Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, etc. 
So she decided she deserved a higher title than queen. The only person who can promote the queen is the queen. So she made herself Empress of India. Queen of England, Empress of India. And they had the grand, you know something about the grand Darbha? It was the costliest dinner party in human history. Costlier than the next 10 you can name together. And you can see for a year the discussion going on on the funding being moved away from famine and public works to service the Darbha. Which by the way she didn't attend because she felt it, she feared it might impair her delicate digestion and therefore the arduous journey across the seas would not suit her. But the newspapers described that as well. Okay, they described that in uh, uh, great detail. The interesting thing is there is great reporting on the pageantry and pomp of the Darbar and there is sincere reporting on the misery of the Madras family. But no one makes the link between the two. Incidentally, the only historian who makes that link is an American historian from the University of California. He died two years ago. His name was Mike Davis in a must-read book for every Indian, Late Victorian Holocausts. A stunningly brilliant book. And he goes into the correspondence of, you know, Krasen, the whole works of all these people, Lytton, and how they knew what was happening. You should also read Professor Madhushree Mukherjee's book, Churchill's Secret Panel. Churchill, whom our Supreme Court judges quote as a great Democrat, what did he say about U.S.? He said, the Indians are a beastly people, who are bad. Beastly people with a beastly religion. The famine is entirely their own fault for breeding like that. He was sanctioning the diversion of millions of tons of grain from Bengal to Europe. Okay? His own age were telling him, don't do it, it will leave. The only thing that came out of Bengal famine for you, by the way, was that it gave you Amartya Sen, who as a kid of 11, watched people dying amidst huge stockpiles of grain. And that was the beginning of his journey to the thesis. Famine is not an absence of food, it is a collapse of purchasing power. That, that came out of the last report. Please note that after 1943, and I will throw out the British, 31 famines in previous 190 years, not a single one after that. Okay. Not a single one after that. So that is the thing to look at. Then, um, so, okay, all of us have become familiar with the word excess debts during COVID, right? What is excess debts? If a society has a normal average number of debts like every society does, suppose that number is 10x. In the given year, you have 15x. The excess debts is 5x. And that 5x is attributed to the closest proximate factor like COVID. That's how you judge. Incidentally, the way we delude ourselves, uh, WHO's number on the number of Indians who died during the COVID pandemic, 4.7 million. Um, Lancet, 4.2 million. Global Council for Development, DC, 4.9 million. Johns Hopkins gave you three running different, all in the millions. Indian government said 4,81,000, end of discussion. No more. Nobody dares question anything. Vishwa Guru has spoken. So you can't you can ask anything after that. Hmm. So this is this is the you know how many excess deaths under British rule? 40 years. Two economic demographers, professors Jason Nickel and Dylan Solomon, have taken on this, have shown us. They've taken 40 years, they've taken out they've taken 40 years because 90, 1881 to 1921, you have robust data. The first Indian census of India comes in 1871. You can find this census on the People's Archive of Rural India, which is my website. Okay, so you have this. The uh, in 40 years, 
What do you think would be the number of excess debts? Make a wide guess. Excess debts, not debts. 100 million. And that's the low end estimate. More than six times what you're saying. That's the low end estimate because it's calculated on the debt rate and life act average of 18, 1881. Whereas the British have already been messing around for 130 years. So if you calculate on what we assume to be the life expectancy and average in uh, in 1760s when they took over India, that figure would be 168. Now, can anyone here, would anyone here disagree with me if I said, if 1% of 1% of that had died in the European country, they'd be screaming bloody genocide. Okay? So these were 168 worthless brown lands. They go. To die. Too bad. They're all breeding like that. Stuff. Churchill explained. Okay. What an anna. Apart from which, I asked the kid, so what did the, oh, my grandfather told me, sir, the British looted India. Of course they did. I mean, they didn't come here to promote improve their stamp collection or promote philately and labor relations, right? The bulk of the British Empire's wealth didn't come from Solomon's mines or the Poirino diamond. It came from that rent in the Indian peasantry. That's where it came from. And that's who Gandhi went to in Japan. Yeah. The bulk of their wealth came from the rack renting, which which uh, that Warren Hastings speaks so openly about. In 1840, the chairman of the East India Company addressed the British Parliament and said, Babat, it is the achievement of this company that we have converted India from a manufacturing power to a country exporting mere raw goods. He's, tell, he's not making any secret of his intentions or his actions. We are looking for good you know, the other thing is that when the British came to India, India accounted for between 18 and 24 percent of global GDP. What do you account for that? They brought it down in a matter of 50, 60 years. In 1921 census, anyone want, want to take a guess again about what was the life expectancy of an average GDP? 1921. It was nine. It was 19 years and 21 years and nine months. Okay? Post independence, you brought it to 70. 21, you can, you can just get out of the net, down and check it out on the census of uh, 20, of 1920. All these things the British did. And that led to gigantic, brilliant, phenomenal rewards. I'm going to tell you three stories. I'm going to show you a couple of videos in two minutes each. You can see who the people there who talk. For me, the most important thing that came out of talking with these people is, you know, my granddad, more than one occasion, right? I mean, I used to hang around as a little kid in his office, bothering him, and he would keep me quiet by, you know, he got me addicted to filter coffee. <laughs> yeah, he would keep giving me sips so that I so that I would shut up and he could work. Yeah. And sometimes some very different people, obviously of a different class, of a different thing would come. And after the event, he would say, these are the kind of people who brought you in this, not us. Because he was a trade union leader. And people would come who had participated in the great railway strike, the great textile strikes, and he would tell me, talk to them, see them, know who they are. Anyway, in the book, the other, th other thing about the great man theory is that the great men were all people who went to England and, you know, Ox return Oxbridge elites. Even there they give credit, even there they give credit to the colonial ruler that you had to get educated in England to know about freedom and independence. They went there, they read. Rousseau, as if Rousseau was popular in England. 
Brooks. <laughs> the least popular person on whom Edmund Burke spent three days of a polemic in Parliament in the attacking attacking social contract, Rousseau's social contract. And, and Tom, to which Rob Tom Thomas Bean replied with the rights of man. Okay. So you have this uh, situation where a bunch of enlightened Oxbridge returned elites got you independent. They did. Most of the people in this book never saw a school from outside, let alone from this. The other thing is, when we, we, we made two stupid laws in 72 and 80, 1980, Swatantrata Samman, Swatantrata Signing Samman Yojana, in which we made the cardinal error of linking recognition and pension. Millions of Indian freedom fighters like N. Sankaraya and the book rejected him saying, and he says it in, on, you can see him on the video, we fought for freedom, not for elections. But when they rejected that, they were rejecting the recognition also because the two were tied together in the law. Okay? And there were others who desperately needed those elections, who never got recognized because we made a bunch of laws privileging male actions. So the way the freedom fighter is defined, it would be a male who went to jail, that is who it is a freedom fighter. Millions, tens of millions of Indian women played as great a role, perhaps a greater role than uh, perhaps a greater role than their male counterparts in the freedom struggle. One example, Babani Mahato, the oldest of the freedom fighters left alive, articulate clear as a bell at age 105 in Purulia, West Bengal, spent the morning telling me you wasted your time coming. I'm not a freedom. Because she accepted the definition that made her husband a freedom fighter, but her an ordinary homemaker. Then she said, he went to jail, Satyagraha. I was married at nine boy, she told me. So I don't think she could call me a boy. <laughs> <laughs> at 105. So she said, I was married at nine. Do you think I learned about all these great philosophies? I fed up joint family of 25 to 30. I fed up, you know. I, cook, I grew the food, I cooked the food, I served, made them. So, at a loss to say something, but to keep the conversation going, I said, uh, Babani ji, then it must have been very hard for you when your it must have been very hard for you when your husband went to prison. She said, No, no, it was much worse when he came back. <laughs> <laughs> then I asked, How could you say that? Why, why did you say that? She said, because he would bring another 20 fellows for me to feed. And you know what this woman was doing? And she knew what she was doing. At the height of the Bengal famine, when people were dying in billions, she grew food, fed that joint family, and fed for two to three months at a stretch 20, 25 underground fugitive revolutionaries in the Apurulia uprising. Far more heroic and risky than anything her husband did in going to jail in Satyagraha or a march, peaceful march on the police station. But who will ever recognize Babani Mahato as a freedom fighter? I do. And that's why she's in the book, prominent. The first of the people in the book is Hausa Bai Pati, another woman. Because of this great man theory, I give special attention to the women who are masculine. Baba Hausa Bai Pate was this incredible character. Oh, and one more character I'll tell you, but let me. Hausa Bai Pate said, you know, her story begins, she was part of the Tufa Sena underground. In 1943, the British were with their backs to the wall in Europe. Imminent Nazi invasion in early 43. All troops went there, which meant that many colonies rose against the British Empire. In India, Chittagong, Midnapur, Korapur, Satara. Satara and Maharashtra, a group of farmers and laborers, took control of 600 villages. It was called the Prati Sarkar, the uh, provisional government of the underground. And 
the arm wing was called to France. The founder of the Pratish Sarkar was elected to the second parliament of India, 1957, Nana Sahib Patil. Anyway, Hafsa Patil, a story begins in front of the police station in Sangli district, in, in now Sangli, but that time Satara, the whole thing was Satara, in front of the bath, uh, in front of a police station, on the behind them the railway station, in front of them the police station. She is being beaten to a pulp by an abusive husband. Big thrashed all about, but the police, of course, continue with their. They don't even come out of the station. They can see it all. They've got ringside. They've got balcony seats. And what's wrong with what's going on? Because. I mean, man beats wife, national sport. Yeah? And uh, so they're not going to do anything about it. Then comes the guy picks up a little rock. Her brother is standing there and does nothing. Good Indian name. When she's begging him to take her home, he says, No, you belong to your husband. Then uh, the husband picks up a rock and says, No, I'm going to smash your skull. He has not, he's reaching of alcohol, everything. Then the police come out. Man beating wife is okay with them, they do it at home. But man killing wife on the doorstep of the police station means somebody will ask her this. <laughs> so they come out, they stop this, they scold both of them, they reprimand them, lecture them for half an hour, reconcile them, and tell them now get out of our place, you get out of the train and go. They protest with Hausa by protest. Well, we can't buy tickets. This joker has drunk it all in alcohol. Police give them tickets, put tickets in their hands, and, the, and the police return to the to find that Hausa buys comrades in the revolutionary underground, the Tufan Sena, have looted the police station of all its rifles, armory, weapons, money, and ammunition. And that was not her husband. That was a fellow underground worker of the food park sale. That was not a brother, that was another comrade in the underground revolutionary food park sale. Many of these people would later become joined the peasants and workers party of the food park sale. And many would join the communist party. And several would join the communist party. There's a huge political spectrum down there with one big figure missing. So, how some by party 74 years later, I'm recording her story and asking her, what is your enduring memory? All these freedom fighters have to be four things in common. Okay, one, very cantankerous. You know, when you're in your 90s, the infant in the book is 98. You've been fighting 80 years for a cause. Somebody questions the integrity of that cause, you don't take it lightly. So, second, they all had a sense of humor. Third, they all were so tolerant of others' political differences. In that same Tufan Sena were communists, PWP, socialists, congressmen, and others. Yeah? And they never saw the other as someone to be crushing or fighting or opposing. with. They saw them as their brothers and sisters. And that's all we need. A lesson in our times of intolerance. But the thing about humor, I asked her, Hausabai, did you uh, find Hausabai, what is the enduring memory of that time? Oh, she's, a, she's cackling with laughter. She's 92 at that time. She died at 94. Uh, she, she says, enduring memory. That memory endures on my back, that comrade scoundrel, he beat me too hard. <laughs> <laughs> then I asked her, did you tell him to stop beating you so hard? She says, I did, I did. I was screaming at the top of my voice, you're hitting me too hard. But he whispered into my ear, how's that guy? It has to look authentically, then the police will come out. <laughs> and, and she was laughing as she said, oh, it's okay. Only then the police. That's Hausa Bhai. At age 94, 95, Hausa Bhai sends a message to the striking farmers and dairy. If, if it were not for my ill health, 
I would be marching shoulder to shoulder with you. She sent a video message recorded by her great grandson. Hmm? And, and she would say about the video when we videoed her, she would say, I have been videoed. My great grandson does it on his own. And uh, then she said, if the government does not concede your demand, ill as I am, I am going to come and join. This is the spirit of the industry. Every one of these people say one thing, which I think is the most important lesson. The difference between independence and freedom. Hausa Bai's leader, Captain Bao, also in the book, the founder of the Tufan Sena, another cantankerous soul captain. I begin the book on one page, one line by Hausa by Captain Bao, Captain Edda Brother. That is Nam the Gare underground. And he says, We fought for two things freedom and independence. We achieved independence. Every one of them saw independence as an event. And an event, you throw out the British, you throw out the colonial ruler, and you established a nation state based on the citizens' rights. That's an event. Freedom. It's a process, not an event. And the, everyone was clear that in their lifetimes they would never see it. And that they would never see it, but they fought. This was the, the third character I'm going to show you on video. Okay. Mallu Swaraj, Telangana Uprising, the most famous woman leader of the Telangana Uprising. I will, it's wrong to call her a woman leader because at age 16, the uprising appointed Mallu Swaraj the leader of all the Dalits, the armed squads, male and female, at age 16, the girl in 1946 was the leader of all the Dalits in the main rise, uprising area, Varangal, Bayram area of Varangal. Madhu Swarajam, another person who tolerate, would suffer fools gladly. And would, how much explaining had to be done to her? I am a plenty journalist. You've known me 30 years. I ask some questions because others have to hear it in your words. But she would get angry because she thought, you know this answer and you're, again, you know, are you baiting me or what? In 1984, I put her before an audience of 1,500 techies in Hyderabad, age group 21 to 25. And Malu Surajan, 84 years old, I'm interviewing her. She loses her camera with me quite often. I, you will not believe me if I tell you that my, me and my group, she loved us. But she was just a fiery spirit who was always looking for a fight. <laughs> and I asked her, Swarajam Garu, I know that slip shots are used as uh, weapons. Hmm. I've seen the Irula tribes hunt birds and rabbits with them. I've seen the Bonda tribes kill, hunt and kill boars with them, wild boars with slip shots. But of what use is it in human combat? Close. I knew the answer and I knew. She got mad. 84 years old. Stands up, ramrod straight, plucks out a slip shot. Puts a cricket ball in it and starts swinging. The translator is ducking for cover. <laughs> then she sees all the terrified young faces and she says, I'll, Okay, I can, never mind. I'll remove this cricket ball from this slingshot and keep it on the table and shows them without a weapon. Then she gets three, four standing ovations from that age group, one third her age. Okay? And they ask her questions. It's all right for you to talk about, uh, you know, fighting for justice. We are techies. What do we do? A woman who never spoke a word of English in her life. She said, oh, who? But who? Which also shows you that you don't have to know English to be well read. And then she said, oh, you're techies. You want to know what you can do? Have you heard of Occupy Wall Street? <laughs> They were stunned. They were stunned that she could say, you know, tell them about Occupy. 
She told them three minutes ago, Occupy Wall Street was full of people like you, young techies who took over Zukoti Park. You know, she said they fought for justice. You can fight. And but again, the question came from the 21 year old techie. You could fight for justice with slingshots and rifles. What can we do? She gave one of the greatest lines I've ever heard. She said, Yes, it's true. The slingshot was my weapon. The laptop and the mobile are yours. Use that to fight for justice. The whole 1,500 were on their feet, giving her a standing ovation that lasted over a minute. I just want you to see two minutes of Alsa Bai, a minute of Captain Bob. What do you Anadu Nalu Vela Mandi Yamaru Laina Samanya Vaina twenty Raitulu Arijana Giri Jana Jana Ma Kalamunde Prana and Arpinchi Porat Tonte A Poratanlo Tupaku and the Kani Ral and the Kani What shall this cochina soap in Sadan Kimiko? Adawalu Magavalu, a feudal is anki betre kanga, murukuri e kamai, gadi lamida, ilanti what is a low kara in the balundi. I was able to get a lot of people who were able to get a lot of people who were Nana leader, Mokadana, area than a lagoon, area the lamb leader. Campova, Tony, training at the Marcus is that than Japatani. What a striking figure at age sixteen. The archives I got it from tell me that the picture was probably taken by the Nizam's police, by the secret police. They shot this. I think whoever that guy was, he was a good photographer. <laughs> What a, I mean, the whole picture is sheer, the whole picture is sheer character. Then, the other thing about the freedom struggle, people came from every section of Indian society. It was not obsolete jails. Remember, the Adivasis of Jangal Mahal, the indigenous people, were fighting in 1763 years after the Battle of Plassey. 40 years they conducted a struggle, 40 years, called very contemptuously by upper caste historians, addressed as the Chuar Rebellion, which is a combination of Chor and Nietzsche in Bengali, which meant, which tells you who was fighting, Dalits and Adivasis, right? Then you have in the 1780s, 90s, the incredible revolt of Veera Party of Kattapoma in Tamil Nadu nearly brought down the East India Company. The closest the East India Company came to collapsing was under the attacks of Kattabhuman, betrayed by the Raja of Kuzukote, helped by the Raja of, uh, I mean, he was helped by the Raja of Ramnar, who was a little softer on him, but generally betrayed. What I'm trying to say is, it was ordinary people who fought when elites were negotiating their place in the Kuzonia. The Raja Rams. The Sindhyas, which we talk about today, they were the people who betrayed the Lakshmi Bhai and Chansi to the British. That's who they were. They make have no illusions about who these people were. So the freedom struggle, the kind of the book has people who are Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Dalits, you know. Uh, atheists, it has farmers, laborers, and uh, carpenters, 
it has in one character is an entire village, crazy village called Panipura in Odisha. They were a Gandhian village. The uh, people in Tamil Nadu, they were communists. It varied in each place, different people participated, but they fought as a unified force to bring colonialism back. And in uh, Panimora village, it's a Gandhian village, it's no other place, village I visited reminded me so much of Asterix coins. <laughs> you know, like they drove the Romans nuts. These guys, in 1942, a bunch of a farmer, an agricultural worker, and a carpenter uh, you know, captured the Sambalpur High Court, the Sambalpur Court, dismissed all petitions and said, your petitions are all addressed to the British Raj. Go home, rewrite your petition and uh, address it to Mahatma Gandhi care of Republic of India. Then we will consider your petitions. So then they all, the baffled police went to the man, magistrate who was a leave and said, we want a warrant for the arrest of these guys. So the ma magistrate said, I won't give you the warrant. I can't sign this warrant, you have no names. So they went back and tried getting these guys' names. They would not give their names. They went, they did like those days, apparently there were magistrates who followed the law. <laughs> then they go to an assistant collector and he tells them, Are, put some name, write A, D, C. And police being the typical dunces that they are, actually wrote A, B, C as their names. In the, in the court hearing, it was hilarious. They, they are in their 90s when they are recounting the story to me. The court clerk had to shout, A, Aziro. B, present yourself. C, come forward. Then they were taken to the prison where the prison chief warden refused to accept them. He told the police, are you nuts? These guys escape tomorrow and I'll have to tell the government that A, B, and C have escaped. <laughs> they drove everybody nuts in the place. And at 90 when I visit them, they are still sitting on Dharna to get a telephone for their village. That is the kind of spirit of these people. Now there is also, as I said, a Dalit fighter. We have completely marginalized the role of Dalits and Adivasis in the freedom struggle. The last living Dalit fighter, he is in great shape. By the way, he is one of two infants. He is just in merely 98. In October this year, I took him to two girls' colleges in Raj, uh, to a girls' college in Ajmer, the Sophia Girls College. The kids aged between 17 and 21. Just, I mean, they were floored by this guy. He strides, he walks faster than I can. He strides onto the stage and he talks to them with great humor, tells them his stories. By the way, when he was, and he, this man addresses a lot of our contemporary debates and dismisses them in 10 words, 12 words. He is a self declared Gandhian, a dissident congressman, which he makes clear, my asli congressman. <laughs> You are dissident. Then he says, uh, I, I said, but he made bombs for 10 years. He made bombs with a revolutionary underground. I said, you are a Gandhian man. I mean, what were you doing making bombs? He said, I was in Goa with the Gandhian stream and the revolutionary stream. But it's very picturesque in India. So beautiful. Gandhiwad or Krantiwad. And he is the greatest admirer of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. I ask him, how can you, a Dalit, yeah, how can you as a Dalit, how did you come to choose between Gandhi, how do you choose between Gandhi and Ambedkar? He got mad. He got furious. He really let me have it. This is what he said, sir. He said, choose. Why should I choose? You choose. Who are you to tell me to choose? Those principles of the Mahatma, I never I follow those. Those principles of Baba Sahib, I never I follow those. Who is anyone to tell me that I cannot follow both? 
in in three sentences a 10 year old debate demolished and i asked him about the different forces you know this old man lives to protect the freedom fighters memorial baba in ajmer because he took me there walking racing through the track cutting through the traffic he walked i was terrified but he was just walking on through the traffic then he showed me the hall it's in a beautiful old building like your something like the adobe buildings you see in new mexico but a beautiful thing he said look at all those faces peering over the walls those are the real estate mafia of ajmer the minute i die they will grab this property he said i'm sharing my story with you you promised me that you will get the chief minister to take over this property and make it a heritage museum for future generations to know what our freedom struggle was about the thing that he is proudest of by the way when he was underground they said to move to bombay those days bombay he goes to bombay who hid him that is the thing he is proudest of he is not proud of having taken a bullet in the quit india movement lay in hospital unconscious for a week nothing who hid him is asking me who do you think hid me priti viraj ko tell you can see the very look hey हम जो है बम बना दे दे विदर जो रिमेट करने हैं सॉरी हम लोग सप्लाई कर देते बच्चे हां बंबई ले जा रहे हैं सप्लाई ले जा रहे हैं कहां ले जा रहे हैं कहां कहीं छोड़ भी दिया हमने गुर कहते भाई खुद तुम आओ तो हम तो पकड़े जाएंगे बड़े आदमी तो मैं तो बच्चे बच्चा जान के छोड़ भी देगा नहीं चंद से कर आजाद और एक और था वो फैक्ट्री देख रहा देखते थे और वो चिट्ठियों को भी अब डाक को पहुंचाना बड़ा मायना रखता था तो हमारी टोली बनाई उन्होंने हमें ट्रेनिंग दी कि भाई इस माफिक से आपको ये चिट्ठी फलानी जगह पहुंचानी है बड़ौदा में देनी है डॉक्टर अंबेडकर को स्वतंत्र थाने में पूछता नहीं ना कोई किताब है जो पढ़ पढ़ेगा कि हमने इस आजादी कैसे दी इसके लिए निकल गया क्या मालूम है ये सब खागे देश को करोड़ों अभी अभी तो वह नहीं कर स्वतंत्र संग्राम में आरएसएस के नो नो इसमें उन्हें भी नहीं करते वहाँ पर अच्छा लगा वहाँ जिसको फॉलो कर तो आप दोनों को मानते हैं गांधी और अब you need to know second the response of the young to this book has been phenomenal okay now our 25 years everybody loves good job is in 60% written 10 months this book is in its fifth edition and um, as i said it's been an education for me to visit those 48 schools and colleges and the fact that the kids are writing emails to me unsolicited say i spoke to my nani she said this my great grand aunt apparently spent 31 days in prison in a satyagraha and he is the prize winner in class 3 he beats tausi abzar a woman who later goes to pakistan because 18 members of her family were massacred one night in the 
He beats her by one mark and cries when he recalls that he beat her. Anyway, he was the, the Munshi, the big, the big officer in education at that time, came to give away the prizes. His prize was a shiny new one paisa. Now, by the way, you could buy things with one paisa in 1939. Arguably, because there were school prize day. You know, so many of you as parents know that day. So he goes on to the stage, little 11 year old, but then he's going to be. And the Munshi packs him, gives him the prize and says, Good boy. Yeah. Now, Nara Lagao, because war has broken out in Europe. Nara Lagao. Hitler Urtabat. Down with Hitler. And shouts. Class 3. Britannia Murdabad, Hindustan Zindabad. And is thrashed to a pulp with that fellow and his cane. Issue a letter, the education department, which stops any other school from giving him admission. Then, but he has drawn the attention of the Gadar party, the underground revolutionaries of Punjab, and goes on to become a great, great revolutionary. I'm just, I'm just Reminded of him by the Punjab story. Punjab and this connect country, San Francisco, who were illiterate peasants who had come here to pick oranges. Yeah? They taught themselves to read and write in Berkeley, evening school, and they were often like they were lectured. They were set on fire by a man called Lala Hadeya. He's not a Sikh, he's a Hindu. Lala Hadnya imbued in them a spirit which made all of them return to India and stage the Gadar insurrection. So, Pajan, education, all these have. Yes, sir, your question. Uh, after independence in the past two years, when Nehru, Pate, and Buddha were not alive, they did not make any particular effort to identify these people. Go on. I am asking. Oh, you are asking. I think that, see, in the first 20 years, everyone was visible. Those who had participated in the freedom struggle were visible. It's from 70s, 25 years of independence, that, they, that the government feels the need to bring a law to identify them. Because they are starting to die off the older generation. But many, many, now, uh, Captain Bao was a legend in Satara. Nobody needed to give him a certificate. Okay, Captain Bao in 2016 is unknown. We failed to place him in our history books. Though Maharashtra textbooks have a few paragraphs on the thing. But Nehru Patel, all of them were themselves freedom fighters. They had also gone to jail. They all write, you should read their writings, they talk about who their jailmates were. What? At that time, they were not thinking about it. I did not think about it till 20 years ago that, my God, suddenly they all died. For me, the biggest tragedy is that in five years' time, not one of them will be left alive. And a new generation of children will not have, will not be able to touch, see, talk to, listen to, engage with, simply touch a bona fide freedom fighter. Now it is the duty of this, my generation, our generations, to commemorate that, and you saw how they commemorate it. A website without a single photo of a freedom fighter. I'm saying this is a great collective failure, and we have to do what we can about it. Yeah. Yes. Can I ask a question? Okay, uh, so my name is Ram. I come from a very, uh, very remote village in Western Rajasthan. Mm. Uh, so my question is very direct. A uh, few years ago, the farmers were sitting in Delhi for about a year. And it teaches me to know like, that when you say that there were so many defense farmers, local colleagues, there were freedom fighters actively contributing there. But when, like, so I thought that farmers were sitting in Delhi, 
that governments will, will be clear. Next time when they go to election, people will teach them less. So what can I talk? Like why do people don't there know? There hasn't been an election after the so election. You can say there hasn't been a national election after that, number one. UP is a, there are one or two states which are completely in the grip of the Hindu party. Okay, but you ask me a question, you're not going to answer. Okay. I have been to those um, protest camps and People's Archive of Rural India covered them more than any general online media. And you're talking, let me tell you something about the history of the peasants and soldiers and their struggles. When I went onto the stage at Sigur, it was winter morning, bright sunlight, and there was a lot of shining affecting my eyes. You know what it was? 200 ex-servicemen sitting in the protest with their medals on their chest. And they told me, at this moment, our sons and grandsons are defending your borders. And the people in the media, you call us Kalismanis. That's what they said. Right. Second, in historically, you know, 1857 was not a sepoy mutiny. In fact, not even Sipahi. The word is Sipahi. The British were as murderous with pronunciation as they were with people. And they, it was not a sepoy mutiny. The Indian Jawan then, the Indian Jawan today is a Kisan in uniform. He has to reflect the mood of his village. That's why you had 200 ex servicemen wearing their uniform proudly, showing they had medals from four wars. 1962 China, 1965 uh, uh, Pakistan, 19, 19, 1971 uh, Bangladesh, 1984 uh, Sri Lanka, 1998 Kabul. They were also. Yeah. So there is a great history. My thesis, when I was in, I was trained as a historian, I never completed the thesis of Professor Panikar. My thesis was on revolts in the colonial army. That person, I'm not talking about air force and navy, I'm talking about army. The army stock is peasantry. And you are from Rajasthan, you know, Seeker, Junjunu, Churu, that is the recruitment catchment ground. One of the three or four most important recruitment grounds for the Indian armed forces. So there is that historic connection between them. And I'm saying that those 100,000 farmers who gathered outside Delhi, they showed us the meaning of the word resistance. Occupy Wall Street was cleared in nine weeks. The NYPD threw out all the protesters in nine weeks. The farmers at Delhi stayed there 53 weeks, got their demands accepted, had the laws taken back, and then moved. Now, elections are another game. Many, many other factors also come in. It's not so strange that. The, Every, everybody is a trade union, we fight these in. Elections, there is also the caste issue comes in, the gender issue comes in, a number of other factors come in. By the way, in the next hour, we're going to start getting the results of five elections, of five stages. And I can tell you that you will find that at least three of them have voted against the central government's party, against the party. At least three, very possibly three. Yeah. Yes, my there are a lot of questions. Yeah, okay, go on. I'll, I'll try to make shorter because. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this was wonderful. Um, you mentioned the NCERT rewriting of history books. Towards the end, you mentioned Andul Sita Ramaraj, and I couldn't help but flash back to that Kasi film, RRR, and it's oh, it <laughs> So, I'm an academic, and one of the questions I have for you is how do we move in sort of how do we create a resistance in terms of how we teach, how we write, um, to undo the work that is already happening out there deeply and scary? The first thing is to create an intellectual sentence. Okay. Not to be moved by or not to be taken. See, one of the things, uh, firstly, about when you're asking of, about the young, for instance, I am very proud of that generation of youngsters who, in 2019, 
spontaneously came to the college gates to the protest venues against the Citizenship Amendment Act. Mm -hmm. I was really proud of them. They were singing the songs of the freedom struggle. They were singing pious. They were reading from the preamble of the Constitution, justice for all, social, economic, and political. I tell you this. It is my belief that if you want to find the distilled, finest distilled essence of the idealism of the freedom struggle, you will find that in the Constitution of India, in the preamble and in the directive principles of state policy. Justice for all, social, economic, political. That's why those freedom fighters say independence is an event, justice is a process. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Words which Ambedkar personally introduced from the French Revolution into the into that. I'm saying that there is plenty of hope on that front. Those kids weren't organized by anybody. There was no conspiracy, no nothing. They came out, they protested against the public court for some. One of them is in jail for two and a half years. That's right. Okay. And not at each hearing is postponed, adjourned, postponed, adjourned to ensure that it will be there. 16 people in the so called Demon Corridor case mm -hmm. have been in jail almost five years. Yeah? <clears throat> because you are under a law called UAPA. These, are, these go further than the colonial laws. This is a 1967 law introduced by the Congress Party to fight insurgencies in the Northeast. The Manipur People's Liberation Army. In 2019, this act was amended to enable me as government or agency of government to designate him as an individual as a terrorist. And then you will never get bail. One of those 16 died in jail, an 85 year old ex priest, Stan Swami, whose memory, memory lecture I gave earlier this year in Ramsey, in his hometown. And it is in the town of his where he lived most of his life. Yeah. And so that is a process that is on, which is, you're seeing it in many countries. You see, if the emergency saw the consolidation of the Indian state as authority, I sometimes wonder if I've seen the emergence of the Indian state as social. <laughs> the, the need to hurt somebody, humiliate your adversary. You know, the Roman emperor, when Caesar returned from overseas conquest, he rode his chariot around the main square of Rome with all the conquered queens and queens tied to the chariot. And then at the end of it, he would make a great show of declaring them free. They had lost their kingdoms, their people in the genocide that the Romans perpetrated. But that was the greatness of Caesar. Okay? So you, you are in a very bad state. You are running governance by gagging. That's what's happening. Yes. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Can I do one thing? Can we ask? Take yeah. three questions of them. Oh. Uh, thank you for being here and thank for this very enlightening talk. Um, when you were talking about freedom and independence, um, yeah. I just wonder if what do all these heroes think about the country now? What it's like? Disillusionment or hope? I guess I will answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Two. Two more. Okay. Uh, you mentioned in your book the last heroes of Indian freedom, and you mentioned earlier that the event was independence, freedom is the process. So uh, we had to understand this from me. There were a lot of days of movement that happened and are still going on. So they are also still the heroes of the Indian freedom. Right? So why last? You could look at it that way. Yeah. more of, uh, it's not a question as much as just to say thank you for, uh, I think I went into journalism because of a story um, on which I saw as a kid in India, I grew up in India. There was a story about this young 16 year old who sat up in Manita, and, and uh, which to me, Manita Punji. Exactly, from Kalahandi. So I grew up in India, extremely comfortable, also 16, and I see on the television screen this kid who gets married who gets bothered for, for some months with this old man and 
That's when I decide I need to write the stories. The thing is, for all the, the, the journalists that did my children to tell the story, they were all incomplete stories, like full of poets. But for some reason, they were the thing. I promote because they promote me to be deep. And it was only when I read your piece on Dalita, which I understood that this is not really a story of poverty or of this. It was a story about mismanagement of money. Pretty much, and that changed the way I started seeing stories being told in India in journalism. You, you end up hearing bits and pieces, and it's left to you to dig. To, you know, to dig so through. that's why we started the People's Archive of Rural India. The People's Archive of Rural India tells the stories, everyday stories of everyday people in their words, on their terms. Okay, and by the way, the story of Banita Punji, the true story, you can read in Everybody Loves a Good Trout, which is available to you right there this morning. Now, was there a third question asked? Yes. I'm just briefly about, what do you think about the new I'm from Odisha, so I have been following about Niyangi, Bokside Mining, Adani Mosque, Great Yoga, but Obar companies like MAC and if you want, they are trying to like, exploit Africa. So, what, what do you think? Okay, let me answer the reverse here on one of the. Uh, I think I call it the Adani miracle. Hmm. In 2003 2004, Mr. Adani was not worth a few hundred million dollars. But from the time Mr. Modi's government comes to power in Gujarat, his wealth starts growing. In 2013, Adani is worth $3.5 billion. Eight years Mr. Modi is in power, Adani is worth $129 billion. That is a growth rate of no one in the Forbes billionaires list has matched. Not even E. Rock plus. Okay. So you can think for yourself how that comes to be the case. Yeah, so it is that new, what you think, what you say is new has been on for many years and it's not just in the morning. That's not true. The, the POSCO, uh, the POSCO fight, uh, the Jagat Singh food battles, those were all Congress. Those were all the UPA. From 1991, whichever party has been in central power, has followed a policy of neoliberal globalization. And you are paying the price for it. And incidentally, those countries that push those policies are themselves building huge barriers because they've got what they wanted out of it. And that's, that was the new thing. Uh, your thing was about. Uh, uh, what do they think right now about India? Okay. Every, the question is put to them, and they will tell you in their own way. Bhagat Singh Jukia asked, I asked him, so what do you think of the country today? The guy I described, the student who got kicked out. He ranted for five minutes about how terrible things are, and then ended on the note, assuring me, Lekin, Samaj Le, the sun will set on this Raj also. That was his idea. That was his idea. Uh, all of them, see many, the very fact that almost all of them remain activists for the next 75 years. Yeah. For me, one of the most curious character, characters is from Chennai, Kamana. He was actually from a village in Tirunelveli, in, in Tuthuri. Yeah. His name is Sankaraya. He died two weeks ago. There are two Tamilians. Many people from Tamil Nadu here? Anyone? Ah, okay. There are two Tamilians in the book. By the way, the book has people from north, south, east, west, northwest. It would have had two people from the northeast. They died during COVID. Not because of COVID, but old age. They were on 100. M. Sankaraya and R. Nallakandu are from uh, Tamil Nadu. Nallakandu is the other infant at 98. These guys, that spirit and character. And Nal uh, Shankaraya was the top student of the American College Madurai. <laughs> yeah, the topper founder of the uh, uh, Kamban Poetry Society, 
Tamil Poetry Society, represented the college and university in football, and jailed in prison 15 days before final exam, and was released hours before independence, before freedom and freedom. I am very proud of it. You know, he didn't get his degree. Okay. Now you see the kind of mindset which will bring you to the present. I wrote a story about him, Nalakana. They are such fascinating characters. Sankaraya at 101, at 98, is taking the bus to Madurai to give lectures to the progressive writers. Then somebody says, No, you can't go by bus, and they take him in a car. And he is just ready to go. Then Nalakana, at 800, Sankaraya was complaining to me, 101. Complaining to me. This family. I said, they, these fellows, they won't let me go out and talk now. They say, COVID, COVID. You can't. He had COVID twice. <laughs> okay. And he was then at uh, Nalakanya, I asked him. One was, one became secretary of CPN, that is Sankaraya, one of CPI. Look at the parties Socialist Party, Congress Party, PWP. CPI, CPI, the spectrum, the spectrum took part in your freedom struggle, except as as Shobaram told you, RSS was a only winner. But Shankaraya complete. When I asked Nalakan, first I knew these guys for twenty years, but I look, I was looking at them with a different lens as freedom fighters, and my first interview with Nalakan. Who is roaming around Tamil Nadu talking to farmers? He is 90, 95 at that stage. And I tell him so, Comrade RNK, that's his name in Tamil Nadu. Comrade RNK, are you still going out every day and uh, campaigning? He says, No, no, Comrade, now I'm old, I leave town only once a week. <laughs> at, at 95, I leave town only once a week. Where the heck do people get that? All of them had this common thing, incredible energy and determination and says. Now they also, they, when I told them, aren't you frightened by what you're seeing? They said, we've seen worse. We've seen worse. All of them address this question one way or the other. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Just one last question. So we have uh, interviewing sir over there. Go in parallel with the journey. So if you can continue asking questions and also have your answers. Your As you mentioned that independence was an event and freedom in the process. So at our level, how can we be a part of that? I think immediately the first thing is to defend your constitution. To defend the constitution of India and to fight for making the directive principles justiciable, legal, fundamental rights. The right to work, the right to food, the right to shelter. These should become rights that can be enforced in the court of law. By the way, the Supreme Court in the last 40 years has given three judgments on directive principles of state policy, part four of the constitution. In directive principles, and the last of the three rulings was by Justice Ashok Ganguly. And incidentally, I was asked to come and speak to all the learned Supreme Court judges. And they have a retreat every year at Bhopal, National Judicial Law Academy. And he explained that in his last judgment in on the so last of the judgments on fundamental on the directive principles, he says that they, because you say they are not enforceable doesn't mean they are not important. The directive principles of state policy are every inch as important as the fundamental rights of the constitution. And please note that the constitution says that it says that that. These rights may not be enforceable in a court of law, but they must be fundamentally informing government policy. Yeah.
I'm saying now many many things are happening that like the amendment to the UAPA, the CAA, that are absolutely undermining the constitution of the freedom of study. So I would say the first thing is the defense of the constitution. And also to reflect on that, the difference between independence and freedom. Yeah, the, I mean, I'm, I'm here to ask and answer questions as much as you can, but you can also, maybe starting in the back door, go and get your dinner and get your friends to talk. Any other pressing question? Or? Oh, sorry, uh, may, I, may I make a request? I completely forgot. I came here to plug a book and I did. Okay, there are copies of the last heroes available there. The fifth edition in 10 months with endorsement of India's top historians and 30 review excerpts. Amazingly, there has not been one negative review, not one. I'm surprised. By the goodwill, by the goodwill for the freedom struggle. It's there within us. Somebody has to crystallize it, catalyze. Now, I'm, I'm here to sign any books that you pick up. There are also a few copies of Everybody Loves Good Draw. Two editions. One is the UK edition, which is a better edited one, and the latest 60th print, which is uh, has an introduction by Gopal Gandhi, yeah? and an updated preface by him. I'm here to sign your books. Books, prize, and power can be. Farmers, laborers, cooks, couriers, homemakers, carpenters, malis. We need their stories in order to better script our own. She said, because I never went to prison, because I was not jailed, did I make no contribution to the freedom struggle?